Welcome everyone. We are here once again of the, in the first International Congress of Whale Watching. Thank you to Turismo de Tenerife and Cabildo de Tenerife. Here today we have new experiences regarding the protected marine areas who just, which just want to protect the seas. We are welcoming to experts Eric Hoyt and Jesus de la Fuente. They are going to give us a conference, a very interesting conference. After every presentation, you can ask them some questions. You can leave those questions in the virtual scenario. And we are we will try to ask as many questions as possible, although we know there will be a lot of questions. Now I give the floor to Eric Hoyt. He's a researcher and scientist. He's a speaker. He has written 22 books, works, reports. He's a very well known worldwide all um, due to his work regarding cetaceans. One of his books regarding dolphins and whales is one of the most important books of the sector. Uh, he's also a researcher at the Whale and Dolphin Conservation. The U in the UK, and he has also designed a tool for the protected marine areas and animals there. So, bien, bien, welcome, bienvenido, welcome to, to our Congress, and this is your time. Thank you, Mar, and uh, thank you, everyone, um, for who made this, uh, who's made this possible. Um, let me just get my see if this shares. Okay, I assume we're all okay. If we're not, shout <laughs> or buzz me. So I think with this, um, uh, with this lockdown and uh, the difficult situation for tourism, this really gives us a fantastic opportunity to uh, renew our ideas about protecting whales and protecting habitat, and it's a good opportunity to renew our relationship with whales. And I always like when I'm presenting to start out in the field with, with the whales themselves and, and to try and give a flavor of, of why we're here. You know, what is the reason that, we, um, that brings us here? And it really is the whales themselves. And for me, that started <clears throat> in 1973 uh, on Vancouver Island. Uh, when I was uh, part of an expedition to study and film killer whales, orcas in their natural habitat. And we were in this, um, uh, we found them after a, a couple of weeks of sailing, really there were no studies at this time. Uh, we found that they were inhabiting this bay um, on Northeastern Vancouver Island called Robson Bight. And at that time, um, Michael Big, who you can see the picture there, was starting to um, study them and, and discovering that you could tell each individual apart by marks on its dorsal fins. Uh, and this area where they were found was a good area for resting, <clears throat> for playing, <clears throat> excuse me, for feeding, and um, also an area where they would rub on beaches. And this was a kind of cultural activity, although we didn't use that word culture back then. It's the study of the culture of whales has become a big thing um, more recently. Um, but this is something that they would do every afternoon, often after um, feeding uh, and resting in, the, in Robson, right in the heart of Robson Bight, they would come to this beach where there were these very smooth stones about the size of a thumbnail. <clears throat> and they would roll on, uh, on the bottom. And um, 
At that time, <clears throat> uh, after we'd been there for three or four years, a logging company um, from Canada came in and said that they were going to log this valley and they were going to put um, log booms across Robson Bight. And I remember talking to the um, the vice president of the logging company and he said, well, the whales will probably just rub on the logs. And it was just a complete um, um, ignorance and um, uh, avoidance of the fact of what the whales were doing there. But however, there were no published papers on this. This was very early on and there was no, nothing to, um, to uh, tell them that, that this was an important area. So we really had to go to the public and we uh, worked over several years uh, trying to ask people, do you want to see these super pods? Do you want to see these whales um, in future? Or do you really want log booms and the money that comes from that? Um, the economy of Canada was really built on this. But this is the kind of thing you would see in bays uh, very similar to Robson Bight that had occurred in the past. And after two or three years, we were able to uh, fortunately convince um, <clears throat> the government to protect a small area. And I've put a magnifying glass there. You can see it's a very small area of, of Robson Bight, um, really only about seven square miles. And even the water area um, was very slow to have any kind of recognition at all. So why do whales, I mean, this was really my introduction to marine protected areas. So this was about early 1980s. And at that time, there weren't very many marine protected areas, which I'll, I'll go into in a minute um, for whales and dolphins or for anything for that matter. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, it was really a new thing. Uh, so uh, why do whales uh, need safe protected habitat in the sea? Well, there's too much ship traffic. Uh, ferries, tankers, um, recreational boats, threats of collisions, um, oil spills. You can see the sperm whale in this picture has been run over by a boat that occurred in the Mediterranean. Uh, overfishing, um, bycatch. Bycatch is really the biggest single killer of whales and dolphins with um, a, a roaring guess of maybe 300,000 whales and dolphins caught in nets and killed every year at minimum. And then of course, military uh, sonar exercises um, such as been seen in the Canary Islands, uh, which you know, fortunately were averted by a 50, mile, 50 nautical mile zone around the uh, Canary Islands, which was uh, a wonderful response to the fact that some of those beaked whales were being killed. So where, where, where am I going with all this? Um, I wanna talk about marine protected areas being useful as conservation tools. Um, but I also wanna ask, are whales useful for making MPAs? And what are the keys to maintaining healthy seas for whales? What can we all do to make MPAs more effective as conservation tools? I'm gonna to do a status report on whether whales and other marine mammals are on the road to good habitat protection. And I also want to uh, figure out how we can show the value or give an insight into how we show the value of marine protected areas, whales and whale watching to society. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, I, I wanted to um, throw this slide up there because just to, to, so we have an awareness that in fact, um, in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, really there were two different camps of people. The marine protected area people were really quite separate from the whale researchers and the conservationists and whale watch operators who were interested in, uh, in whales and dolphins. And I put together this book, Marine Protected Areas for Whales, Dolphins and Porpoises, partly to put to try to put those two people, two sets of groups of people together and to get them starting to talk about solving some of the problems. And I think part of this was the bias that people thought whales and dolphins are just out there wandering around, you know, and they don't have any particular 
uh, need for protected areas. But in fact, what we've learned, what you've learned around the Canary Islands and what we've, we learned in um, Canada and many other countries was that whales, uh, once you identify them, you start to see that they do come back to the same places. They do have favorite places that they, uh, uh, that they need that you can call habitat and that needs protection. So what is a marine protected area? <clears throat> uh, as you can see here, um, the definition according to the IUCN, uh, clearly defined geographical space managed through legal or other effective means for long-term conservation of nature. So conservation is the key aspect of it. Uh, MPA is really just a generic term for lots of different kinds of areas around the world with hundreds of different names. Um, you know, including special areas of conservation uh, and, uh, of course, many different language names as well. Most MPAs use this biosphere reserve architecture with the diagram I show on the side here, which really just means that you have core areas that might be highly protected and then surrounded by areas where you might have tourism, and uh, other use, artisanal fishing, and then an outside boundary, which is a sort of transition area where more, more kind of uses of the sea can occur. And this has been very effective uh, in terms of um, integrating humans into the idea of um, protecting uh, marine areas. And sometimes it includes parts of land, and sometimes it's a lot more complicated than just a single area as I'm showing here. We also have to recognize that marine protected areas are just one tool. There are other tools for protection. Of course, there are directives that, um, you know, I remember when the UN General Assembly um, voted to um, stop drift netting. And of course they have no uh, power to enforce that globally, but in fact, I think it was about 50% of the drift netting over a, a relatively short amount of time uh, stopped simply because of that directive. So there was a recognition that this was a ter you know, terribly destructive method of fishing and really we needed to, to stop it. So sometimes these other rules are important and certainly in, in concert with marine protected areas, they're very useful. So how useful are MPAs for whale conservation? Well, I think one of the key things to remember is that humans identify with place-based conservation. We, we do that, of course, on land. And we, we, if we think that there is an area out on the sea that physically protects these um, whales or other species, that's that's um, something that our species really uh, relates to, um, even if it's um, somewhat um, symbolic. In other words, it might be just part of an area that's protecting this species, but it still is something that um, is important for us. I think, um, so that's the idea of the platform for stakeholder engagement. Um, zoning is also something that's important to realize. And in this just um, diagram on the right, you can see a very complex um, set of zoning related to uh, uh, protecting areas at both ends of a humpback whale migration, for example, with core areas in, you know, in the uh, lighter um, parts of the diagram. And, um, and then the same kind of biosphere reserve architecture around it. Um, for buffer zones. Uh, so these, but this zoning, I think, is really a key component. So if you have a marine protected area and you take a certain part of it um, just for the whales, I think that's really important. Uh, Mark Simmons and I proposed this idea a few years ago that for whale watching that um, it might be a good thing to experiment with of taking uh, one third of the time and space that you go whale watching and just reserve it for the whales. <clears throat> and uh, I think that's, um, it's the kind of, you know, 
idea that we need, the, the sort of idea that we need to uh, encourage in future. Um, because, um, you know, whales need time to themselves, they need uh, space. And um, also, what, if you do reserve certain areas for them, then um, uh, you can study what is the difference in terms of their reaction in that area compared to other areas uh, where there is intensive uh, whale watching or other, other activities. So um, in terms of whales um, for ocean conservation, they're very important because humans identify with whales and uh, they're umbrella species. They bring in, if you protect a, a whale area uh, because their need for habitat is large, they're gonna protect a lot of other species with them. They're also good indicators of the health of the sea. Whales are, um, all marine mammals are um, tethered to the top of the ocean by their need to breathe. And so they come up and they're visible and you can monitor them by, you know, by plane and by boat and by satellite pictures and all kinds of things. So that indication, indicator, um, both of biodiversity and health, you know, if you get whales stranding on beaches, you can look at their tissues and find out what, uh, uh, what might be wrong out there. So that's really important. Also whales fertilize and support life on the ocean floor. Um, and that's uh, in terms of promoting uh, uh, phytoplankton growth and, uh, uh, and everything else. So what's, <clears throat> what is a healthy ocean? Thriving supply of food, uh, you know, indicating biodiversity, uncontaminated waters, quiet waters, controls on boats uh, to, uh, so the whales aren't disturbed. Um, functioning ecosystem, that, you know, that's the bigger picture that in fact, um, it's not just the ocean. You know, we see that with killer whales in the west coast of Canada, They're, they depend on the salmon in the rivers and the rivers are dammed and, and half of the salmon is um, unavailable to them because uh, it can't get up the rivers. Um, present and future management of potential human threats is really important. Uh, strategies to address climate change, of course, and uh, we really need informed and engaged humans that are sharing that habitat and watching over. And MPAs, I think, are part of the picture. These are, uh, I'm not going to go over these, but this is just uh, IUCN. Um, IUCN has uh, given various categories to protection levels of MPAs. And sometimes these are just zones within one MPA. You could have one MPA with all six of these, all seven of these categories. Um, but it just moves from uh, strict nature reserve um, in the category one or wilderness area all the way to um, more something that's more just the sustainable use of natural resources. And really we find that the category one is really, really important in terms of uh, uh, keeping biodiversity and, and keeping some semblance of what the ocean is actually like. If we're trying to um, do too many things in a protected area, um, I think everything suffers. So the steps to maintaining healthy seas for whales or cre you know, creating an MPA, you've got to locate their habitats using, uh, using all the research that we have to hand, uh, identify the oceanographic conditions, evaluate the threats, establish good baselines and monitoring, uh, and gives, again, give stakeholders a stake. And you have to look at the available legal structures to devise management plans and set up management bodies that work. And, you know, that shouldn't, shouldn't be, uh, I mean, we're fortunate in, uh, in Europe and uh, Canary Islands, we, we have the, um, uh, the laws that can do a lot of these things. I mean, I remember when I first came to the UK and there were 77 pieces of legislation that were involved in trying to make a protected area. And so it took about five or six years 
I think even longer than that to uh, refine the legislation before we could really even think about protecting pieces, large pieces of the ocean. So for a long time, there was one tiny protected area in uh, Britain and that was it. So uh, in terms of the status of marine protected areas, and this is all marine protected areas, not just for whales, 7.6% uh, of the ocean as of a couple days ago uh, was uh, protected. And, um, <clears throat> but, <clears throat> excuse me, and about 2.6% in highly protected no-take reserves. And, <clears throat> 1.2% <clears throat> on the high seas, which is most of the ocean, uh, is protected. So really, we have a massive gap on the high seas. Uh, the high seas is everything outside of 200 nautical miles. And that is, uh, I think, 54% of the ocean. So most of the ocean is not protected. And we're waiting on this um, UN um, BBNJ process, which is creating legislation to be able to make uh, MPAs on the open ocean. And the IUCN target has been 10% of the ocean, so we're still short of that um, by, 19, by 2020. Um, but we're adjusting that target to 30%. Um, and about 30 countries now have signed up to that. Um, uh, including Spain and Portugal. So 30% of the ocean by 2030. So that's getting to be significant. <clears throat> so 2014, um, a scientist, um, Edgar, put together five key features of successful MPAs. And th these factors were that they're no take, well enforced, older than 10 years, larger than 100 square kilometers, and isolated by deep water or sand. And if we look at Robson Bight, the area that I was involved, involved with, well, it has one, one of these, it's older than 10 years. So it really doesn't uh, qualify. If we take uh, the Papahano Mokuakea Marine National Monument, which is the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, it really <clears throat> is a very good example of something that uh, ticks all the boxes. Um, another, really the first whale marine protected area, I wanted to throw this in um, just for a bit of history, was Scammon's Lagoon for gray whales in 1972, this purple area. And, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of an easy area um, to designate because you knew the gray whales were coming there every year and using it. And, uh, you know, the boundary was quite clear. So, so Mexico, uh, became a pioneer and protected that area in 72 and then added several other lagoons, uh, San Ignacio, and protected the, the land around it um, to create a biosphere reserve, which has been, uh, uh, you know, a, a very interesting and, and valuable uh, addition to the tourism for Mexico because the, you know, the um, Whale watching there is very important for uh, local people. And uh, they also took control of their own whale watching by throwing out the American boats, you know, the, uh, which was a, a really interesting um, process. But also, uh, you know, at that, uh, at that point, um, people were saying that in many ways, El Vizcaino was a reserve on paper, but then there was a threat to, uh, um, develop the salt works in one of the lagoons and um, people from local people and people from around Mexico got together and uh, opposed this and um, uh, uh, Mitsubishi, the uh, salt company, uh, withdrew, which was fantastic. So that was a case of the stakeholders really taking, taking control and um, making a difference. So El Vizcaino, I think, has um, come quite a ways with these five factors. And it also has this key sixth factor, which I think should be included, which is the strong, engaged community of stakeholders. You know, really, that's what's going to 
make marine protected areas last. I mean, that's really what we we see as a successful thing in all the places where it's really working. <clears throat> so are we protecting whales and other marine mammals in these areas? This was a map I put together out of my book a few years ago and really about 600 of these 17,000 MPAs had substantial marine mammal content. The red areas are existing MPAs, the, the, um, the uh, blue areas are proposed and the tan areas are um, ecologically or biologically significant areas identified under uh, the CBD, um, which aren't, aren't like MPAs, but at least tell you where some of the uh, important areas are. And, and really we found that uh, looking at this map, that, mo that all these areas were essentially around land or close, I mean, a lot of them are, are just dots along the coastlines, which you can hardly see on the slide, but um, uh, they were political and um, socioeconomic in nature. So they might've started out with the idea of protecting habitat, but then they, um, uh, the, the boundaries were shaped, were reduced or, you know, shaped into other, um, into other forms. And really it was very, became very sort of incidental in terms of whether it protects marine mammals or not. So looking at that, we just really thought if we're going to protect marine mammals in the largest part of the ocean and, um, uh, and have, and have a true sense of where marine mammals are, we were going to need another tool. And I think, um, you know, one of the, one of the reasons we need to um, care about whales and, and the ocean uh, now more than ever, the ocean, we have to realize it's in the process of being carved up for uh, fishing, for hydrocarbon exploration. It's a motorway for world shipping and we're still waiting for this regime for managing most of the ocean. But and meanwhile, we need to know more about uh, where, these, um, where these whales are. So we set up a task force um, in 2013 uh, through the IUCN, Marine Mammal Protected Areas Task Force, looking at the 130 species of marine mammals and to try to identify um, a project to try to identify where their habitats are. This task force had a number of objectives, but really this last one to enhance capacity with new conservation tools has really become our dominant uh, goal, which is uh, developing this new tool called IMAs or Important Marine Mammal Areas. We had a um, three year period where we took the criteria uh, around to scientists and to the public and uh, had consultations. These are, are the eight criteria or sub criteria that we use. They are aligned with other um, tools like key biodiversity areas and, and uh, EBSAs, ecologically or biologically significant areas, um, important bird areas, they're similar. They're not, um, uh, there are some things that are particular to marine mammals like um, distinctiveness, which brings in culture, um, but in large part, they match quite, um, quite closely. So the definition, uh, an IMA is a discrete portion of habitat important for one or more marine mammal species that have the potential to be delineated and managed for conservation. So they're not marine protected areas and they're not identified on the basis of management considerations. They're evidence-driven. It's a purely biocentric process based on applying scientific criteria um, to the best available science. We have a three-stage process. Uh, we start with areas of interest that are nominated. They can be nominated by anyone, by the public, um, and certainly by the 20 to 40 scientists that we um, bring to the workshop, they'll nominate some of the areas of interest. Others will be marine protected areas that exist already. And we'll take those into the workshop 
and the uh, 20 to 50, um, 20 to 40 workshop scientists will then evaluate these and decide which ones are going to be nominated as candidate IMIS. And then they go to um, a review panel. Um, and the um, about a third, a quarter to a third of them are turned down. And uh, quite a few of them are returned to the points of contact who nominated the candidate IMIS for uh, more uh, more data or you know more more work on them. So this gives you an idea of pre-workshop what the areas of interest might look like in the Northeast Indian Ocean, Southeast Asian seas, where we were a couple years ago, and then at the workshop we come out with something like this, and then after review, that's what you you end up with, and that um, will go on our uh, website. <clears throat> This gives you an idea of what we've done so far. Um, most of the Southern Hemisphere, uh, workshop by workshop over the last four years, uh, as well as the Mediterranean and these other areas. Uh, the next area we're going to do is the West Coast of uh, Latin America uh, and then the Atlantic, but we, we don't know the schedule yet for that. Um, this is a snapshot from the e-atlas online which you can all look at and then if you click on any of these areas uh, well this is the uh, polar projection for the uh, extended southern ocean uh, so there isn't so much distortion but when you click on these areas you will get a description of that particular IMA and uh, and then maps and <clears throat> more more information So in total, uh, well, the largest um, IMA is nearly 3 million square kilometers. That's quite an exception. Um, Prince Edward Islands and Western Oceanic Waters IMA. And the smallest is the Akrotiri IMA for Mediterranean monk seals. Uh, the total area of all the 159 IMAs so far is 15.6 million square kilometers. Um, about half of them are less than 10,000 kilometers in size and only 13% are greater than 100,000. Um, you can go on the, on the website again, it's a searchable database, so you can pull up things by species or by uh, location. Uh, you could download um, uh, spatial, the, the spatial layers um, on request. And these are some of the outputs that we have already. Um, the way it's being used, because if we don't, you know, if we're creating this tool and it's not being used, it, you know, then it's, there's no point in creating it. But we've made um, uh, agreements and talked to people at the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Convention on Migratory Species, IMO. Uh, and I think, um, uh, you know, one of the immediate uses is going to be marine spatial planning because so many countries are planning what they're going to be doing in their waters. And if they don't have a layer for uh, marine mammals, they won't consider it. Um, we had a CMS uh, resolution in 2017 that brought the Convention on Migratory Species, nations, parties, and range states uh, into the picture. Um, and uh, so that's, that's been great to have that um, backing us up. These are some more of the follow-ups that we've had. Um, the EBSA process that I was talking about is going to use IMA layers for future revision. There are proposed MPAs um, in Vietnam, Bangladesh, and other countries that have already used IMA information successfully um, to create these new IMAs. Uh, about 30 key biodiversity areas, which is a tool, another tool of IUCN have been identified in IMA workshops. This was a big surprise with the US Navy. Um, they uh, took a look at all of our IMAs and uh, put them um, uh, and, and decided they were going to avoid testing low frequency sonar near them. And this was put into the, uh, uh, the register, which is uh, a, a published document 
indicating um, you know, the procedures for the US Navy. Uh, through a couple of workshops, the International Whaling Commission has adopted MS to identify ship strike issues. And they're also gonna work with IMO to help uh, identify speed and lane restrictions. So just um, to give you a, a quick example of how it's been useful or how, how it actually could have been more useful if we had Emma's before the Pelago Sanctuary was created in the Mediterranean. You can see this diamond shaped um, area is the Pelago Sanctuary, which came in about 2001. And um, we didn't have the Emma, the Emma's at that point, but since then we realized that the uh, orange area, the Emma really, the MPA probably should have extended further west. And, uh, but you know, the, the fact that we know that now has stimulated a process within ACABAMS, the CMS treaty in the Mediterranean to um, look at how they can um, uh, create protection for sperm whales and fin whales that are getting hit in this area outside of the Pelago Sanctuary. So this is, um, yeah, how can we show the value of whales and MPAs to society and politicians? I like putting this slide in because I think it's, this is our, our um, challenge really is to try to talk to uh, the wider public and to try to help them to see the benefits that um, you know, protecting marine mammals and protecting uh, biodiversity and MPAs will have. And of course, I've weighted this down on the side of benefits, um, but you know, there certainly are costs that, that need to be um, considered. And um, perhaps you could look at this slide uh, uh, in the um, in the review, you know, later on, because uh, but it, it's you know, they're just examples. But I think we really need to embed the idea of marine protection and MPAs in society and, and try to calculate, even though we say it, you know, it's so that uh, protecting the whales themselves and uh, marine mammals are so valuable uh, in themselves, we also have to address these things in an economic sense. Um, and I think, you know, part of it is uh, capturing the imagination of people by telling stories about special whales. And I threw a couple of the albinos um, in the lower uh, part of the picture. So where do we go from here? I think renewing our relationship with whales and their habitats, sustainability, diversifying the tourism products and impact on species and habitats. I've been saying to some of the people that I know that are doing whale watching that this is really a time for reevaluating our relationship to whales. And I, I think the answer is, you know, not stopping whale watching, of course, but looking at how can we um, spread any impact that we have on the whales by having a um, perhaps land-based whale watching as well as boat-based, having nature watching, marine nature watching as well as whale watching, uh, having centers, where people can see interpretive dis displays on land, which are part of the, the tourism product. So it's really being clever about um, how you spread this impact and also trying to determine the carrying capacity. I know you were talking about that in, in recent days and it's you know something that uh, Patagonia uh, Peninsula Valdez has, has uh, dealt with and um, and, and really to a degree, any successful whale watching place around the world has to think about carrying capacity because what's good for, for 10 ships or 20 ships is not necessarily, and good for the community is not necessarily the same when you have 50 or 60 out there. Um, I think um, IMAs are gonna help with this 30% ocean protection in MPAs by 2030. Um, as well as the marine um, important burden biodiversity areas, you know that's uh, that's going to that's going to help a lot. The United Nations um, biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction process and closing data gaps in the high seas. I think this is 
what one thing we're trying to stimulate with the task force is uh, a decade of ocean uh, study on the high seas to really try and ramp up what we know about whales uh, offshore, which we don't at the moment. And then also looking at how IMAs and MPAs can be used more effectively to monitor against threats uh, to cetaceans and uh, including climate change. So I'd like to throw this last slide in um, when I make a presentation because this is a place where I've spent some time Bering Island in the Commander Islands State Biosphere Reserve in Russia. And it's a place that is really reserved for whales. Um, 30 nautical miles around this island is the uh, reserve bound boundary. And really you can go up on this hill and provided it's not foggy, which it is often in fact, um, or stormy, you can almost always see whales. I mean, they, they're Baird's beaked whales, humpback whales, killer whales, uh, sperm whales in the distance. It's an extraordinary area, but I, I do think we need more areas like this where there are just whales and a few humans because we're losing those. So thank you very much. And I would welcome uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. It has been an interesting presentation. And of course, we have a lot of uh, questions. So we are going with them right now. First of them say, do you think it's important to involve the local population in the management of the protected marine reserves? If so, can you give some positive and negative example in relation to the role of local communities in conservation policies? Oh, can, can you repeat it? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Do you think is it important to involve local population in the management of protected marine reserves? Yeah. If so, yeah. Yeah. if so, can you give some positive or negative example uh, in relation to the role of local communities in conservation policies? Yeah, I think it's it's vital. You know, that's why I was showing that example of of Mexico, where where really very local people who were not who did not consider themselves empowered originally, you know, literally threw out the um, the U.S. the big U.S. boats that were you know doing all the whale watching and taking the money away. And part of their structure was, you know, helping to create and uh, enforce this marine protected area to make sure it stayed as a protected area. So I, I, you know, I can't emphasize enough that it's important to involve people uh, to bring them to the table. You know, the the key thing is starting at the beginning, starting early on. Um, you know, in the planning process for marine protected areas. Um, so that the needs of local people are included, you know, if it's artisanal fishing or sports fishing or, you know, some other activities um, and, and, of course, whale watching. Um, I suppose the negative parts, I don't know if I'm, yeah, so some of the negative aspects are, I mean, it's easier, it's easy in a dictatorship to create a marine protected area because the dictator can just say, okay, we'll protect this. And there are examples, I mean, in, in not that um, Russia, well, Russia had dictator, uh, the Soviet Union had dictator-like um, examples of incredible protected areas through their Zapovednik um, re, um, areas across Russia, where they mandated complete protection. You weren't allowed to take anything out of them. And, you know, this, this can work quite well, but I think ultimately it works, it may work for a while or it may not work at all, but it may work for a while, depending on what the penalty is. If you, um, if you, you know, if you refuse to, um, uh, to follow the rules, um, but ultimately it is down to the people that are using the area that are traveling through the area that are living around the area as to whether it's it's actually going to function as a marine protected area and they, and the local people have to see the benefits mm -hmm. you know they have clean water that they have um, a clean ocean to 
you know, to do recreation, um, all these things. So, um, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a person, uh, Mercedes Reyes, is asking you because she's very shocked about the numbers of Tidasians that nowadays are still killed by cats. Mm. Um, she's asking you, is there any realistic way to stop it anytime soon? Mm. Yeah, bycatch is is shocking, and it's it's a really uh, you know we have we have one person working within whale and dolphin conservation, our group, um, who is focusing on that and and a team as well, um, and really you almost have to go fishery by fishery, and you know and to try to lessen the amount that are that are killed. I mean the if you can convince governments that certain kinds of nets can't be used, then you can stop it within national waters, potentially. But you still have more than half of the ocean, you know, on the high seas, and you have a lot of countries that are poaching, that are moving around. Um, you know, I won't name the countries, but there are a lot of them, and there are still a lot of drift nets being used, which is the most destructive method of um of catching fish um it's it's better than it was uh you know 20 or 30 years ago but it's still shocking um i mean i i have to you know because i'm older and and have seen some of these things from even going back to the um, 1970s the one example that gives me hope is that at one time the tuna dolphin issue you know, that there were uh, literally millions of dolphins of only three species, three main species in the Pacific, spinners and spotteds and common, that were um, killed um, in the process of catching tuna. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just, you know, it, it, if it had gone on much longer, you would, you would see I mean, I'm sure we saw some whole populations eliminated. Fortunately, there are still these species there because they are in great number. But um, it was really the photograph of, or, or the video of a, um, somebody who um, got on board one of these boats, uh, tuna boats, and um, was crew for a while. But his ultimate goal was to show what was happening and managed to get um, amazing video that really shocked the world. And, and it caused, you know, uh, people to uh, boycott uh, tuna that was, you know, that was caught um, using these methods. And that's reduced it to, I think it's about three, 3,000, three or 4,000 a year that are killed. I'm not, I, I think that's, it's around that number, but you know, that's still a lot, but we're, we were talking about millions. And I, and I think it's, um, I can't remember the exact figure, but I, it, it's 2 million maybe were killed that they know of over a period of um, um, maybe 10 years, 10, 15 years until uh, the 1970s. Uh, and that this was part of the stimulus for the U.S. putting in the Marine Mammal Protection Act. You know, the fact of this um, happening and that people were becoming aware of it. But if they weren't aware of it, if they, you know, if we didn't have that person, you know, getting that uh, amazing video, we wouldn't have it. So I think there is a role for people to make government and make um, the powers that be aware of um, what's going on there. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And uh, we have a question uh, coming from Jude Isabella, and she's asking you, uh, has the pandemic situation helped further push the, the idea to policy makers that limiting ocean noise to protect marine mammals, such as whales, is possible? So ha has the pandemic situation been uh, good for whales in terms of less noise. Is that what? Yeah, yeah. Is it, that, is, it is the question, yeah. Yeah, I, well, I think it's, I haven't seen anything where it's actually been measured, but it must have been good, at least 
uh, initially. I mean, there's a lot of shipping that still goes on. And I know there's um, there's evidence that there's there's some stuff going on that's out of uh, out of purview, you know, that's not being seen um, that worries me uh, because we were all locked down and unable to do very much. But um, but I do think it had to have an effect in terms of of nature. And, and you know, we saw this on land. All of us saw on land. I mean, maybe you didn't so much in the Canary Islands because it's it has such a nice nature already. But in Britain, we we saw so many we saw and heard so many songbirds and um, evidence of nature that that we were missing before. I suppose our senses are also heightened. Mm -hmm. But I think the you know probably the noise was less. But uh, it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, when we're out of this situation if um, if there are some papers that document mm -hmm. this. I I haven't seen anything yet. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We have a lot of questions, so we have to go uh, faster because uh, there is a lot of people writing. <laughs> Okay, I'll uh, try to answer faster, sorry. Yeah, here is Lisa Steiner asking two questions. Who enforce any, any high seas MPA? Who would enforce it? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's up, that's, we don't know yet. That would, that's what the, uh, uh, that's what the UN is trying to decide and the people that are in that process, the lawyers uh, mm -hmm. right now. So hopefully we will have some news in the next year. Perfect. And the same person is asking, what happens when waves move, like uh, we saw two days ago uh, on Norway, they were moving, they are moving from Tomso to Senja. Senja, Senja, I don't know how to say. They are moving, the waves are moving uh, to the south of Norway. Yes. Be because of the herrings, they are moving. So oh, right. she's, she's, she's asking, what happens? I don't oh, know. What, you mean about what? The protection, the area. I hope, I, I think. Um, for the marine protected area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Move yeah. out of the area. Okay. Yes. I mean, that, that's, that's an issue. And it's an issue with IMAs too. You know, these things need to be revised from time to time. And you need to, um, uh, yeah, you, you, it, it is. Um, there is movement and there's going to be more movement with climate change, mm -hmm. you know, because prey is moving all the time. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's, it makes things more difficult, but, but if we have good evidence that certain habitats are important because they, you know, they have upwellings and they have other ways of uh, supporting, uh, uh, whale populations, um, there has to be some confidence that those areas will be, if protected, will continue to be good, even if there are gaps. You know, there there are lots of cases where whales have moved away from marine protected areas, like Stellwagen Bank, in U.S. Yeah. waters, and people thought, well, why did we protect them here when they've moved away? And um, they were just away for one or two seasons because the prey had moved, but then they were back again. Mm -hmm. So I I think. Um, yeah, I, I think that answers it. Perfect. And mm -hmm. uh, once some marine area is protected, uh, which are the main tools to make effective this protection? protection? Well, people um, having um, areas that are highly protected within the marine protected area, you know, so that there's, there's a core of biodiversity protection that's really strong. Um, I think there have been a lot of mistakes made with marine protected areas early on where they tried to um, allow fishing, allow everything, and, and to try to manage it all in one big soup. And, and really, it, it's, um, it might work for a while or it might work in some seasons, but um, there was a degradation of that marine protected area over time. So I, I, I'm a big fan of uh, zoning. I think zoning is really the way. And, and I think we, we do need to make some hard decisions about what we're doing with the ocean. So sometimes these are not um, immediately economically 
attractive, say to fishermen or to tourism or to boat traffic or or um, oil and gas exploration. But you know, you if, if we want biodiversity and we want um, a, a healthy ocean, we've got to make some of these hard decisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lisa Steiner is again asking you uh, about your opinion about Japan whaling and the leap captures of, in Russia. If those countries aren't signed up to MPA on Orima, there is a big loophole. Hmm. Well, you know, that's a good question with Japan. Uh, we haven't um, been in Japanese waters yet. We're not. We're not going to. Uh, we're. We're still going to have emas wherever, you know. We'll, we will. We will show where they are, so that it's not going to stop us because we're not a political process, and and in fact, I've worked in Japan. I know many Japanese scientists who will be part of whatever workshop we have when we go to the Northwest Pacific, and the same with Russia, and uh, that's. Uh, you know, it may it may still be that it takes time for the the appreciation of what a marine protected area can do, and and how it can protect the sea. But uh, you know, I think um, you know we're we're on a shrinking planet in many ways in terms of our of our um, uh, biodiversity and you know, all the, the problems that we have. And, and I think there is a, a kind of universality. Uh, if, if COVID has taught us one thing is that we're all in the same boat, you know, in a, in a way that climate change didn't quite do. You know, I think, I think people will realize, are realizing that climate change puts us all in the same boat. But I think that that actually may help the situation with disparity in, um, Japan and uh, uh, and and Russia to some extent, uh, although Russia has a lot of positive signs too. I know from experience of working there. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question about Madeira Island because it's considered um, an IMA. So, what do you think about Canarias or Tenerife Island? It is possible they will be designed uh, an IMA also. Yes, I, th I think it's certainly a candidate with all the species. I think, what is it, 22 species? Mm -hmm. And, you know, some really uh, very good science around the Canary Islands with all the beaked whales, which is fabulous. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I'm really excited about when we come to Canary Islands in the next few years, because I think that's, it's going to be a, a, a jewel in the... Um, you know, in that part of the Atlantic. So, uh, uh, and I'm not just saying this because we're, you know, we're, that's where we are now, but it's, um, uh, it's, yeah, it's a good candidate. It will have to go through the process of, you know, an area of interest and then the experts talk about it and shape the boundaries and shape the, uh, the reasons for protecting it, but it certainly fits a lot of the criteria. And we have a last question because uh, we are on time. So uh, there is a question that about the factors to take into account to assess the carrying capacity in a place like Tenerife. The carrying capacity for whale watching? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, um, it's really particular to every place. You know, um, if you, for example, I always give an example of um, Iceland and um, uh, a place like, well, Stowag and Bank, or I don't know, a place where you might know uh, very well. Um, well, there's some, some places because of geography that the whales are in fairly narrow areas. And if you have a lot of boats in there, you're going to have um, people doing boat watching rather than whale watching. and as as opposed to a place like Iceland where you're going out from different ports around the island that are going uh, fanning out. So there's no kind of one area where they all the boats converge. And that makes it possible to have a higher carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. I think it has to be evaluated 
by um, experts and stakeholders and whale watch operators in discussions. And, and it, um, uh, I don't think there's a science to it. I think it's, it's a decision, you know. It's also a decision of what kind of whale watching you want. You know, do you want high value ecotourism where people pay a lot of money to a single boat because it's a really high quality experience you know they go out there it's it's fairly rare there aren't a lot of other boats out there um you know or do you want mass tourism where you have um hundreds of thousands of people uh paying a small amount you know they stay in in hotels big hotels rather than lodges you know it's there there are decisions that communities make if I can tell a very quick story, in Kaikoura, New Zealand, a few years ago, uh, a, little, a little town on the east coast of New Zealand that has very successful whale watching, they had to decide a few years ago whether they were going to build a big hotel and whether they were going to mass tourism. And it looked like they had the possibility to do that. And the, the people in the town got together and decided they didn't want that, that that would degrade the quality of the whale watching and uh and they decided to stay with closer to what they had you know and and to build that whale watching community um quality label really really strongly so uh, you know those are decisions that a community has to make with its tourism department boat operators everybody who's involved shop owners who are servicing the whale watchers um and scientists so uh, related to to you to you rapidly, we have a last question about yes, sustainability and uh, eco tourism. Do you think uh, whale watching uh, management is actually more responsible than uh, the situation uh, one decade ago? And the situation what? Uh, the whale watching, whale watching one decade ago was the same, or no? Whether it's, it's better, it's a more sustainable activity of ecotourism, or it depends on the area. I don't know. Yeah, it's a really hard. That's a hard uh, general question. It is. I mean, I don't think there's very much whale watching that is actually ecotourism. You know, if you look at the at the fine definition of ecotourism, I think that'd be a great goal. To, to make it more ecotouristic in the pure sense. Um, and it can be, but I think it's, um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It, it varies so much. It's really, it's, it's a tough question to answer in the abstract. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. <laughs> in any case, it has been a great pleasure to, to, to talk to you, Eric, to, to know your work and your investigation and uh, we keep following you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mar, and thank you, everybody. Uh, now we are going to give the floor to our second speaker. He is Jesus de la Fuente. He is the scientific and technical coordinator at Marset 2 project. This project gathers together a lot of professionals and he's going to talk us about his experience about uh, this Marset 2, 2 project regarding the Macaronesia, the four archipelagos. La, he's going to talk to us about these marine areas and how to analyze the cetaceans living in these uh, marine areas and the indicators to analyze the areas and uh, cetaceans. Welcome, Jesus. Hello, good afternoon. So, when you want, I'm going to share the screen. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I will continue in line with 
Eric Hoyt, the previous speaker. And now I'm going to focus on the health of these marine areas and the health surveillance of this area, uh, not only regarding cetaceans, but the whole habitat, the whole environment of these marine areas. Twenty years ago, we uh, started a, a concept, the Waje. We are all connected in our planet, animals, vegetals, humans. We are all connected in our world. So human health depends on the good health of the environment, of nature, and of animal nature. With our initiative, with our Mars2 project, we analyze in depth this concept. Preservation of cetaceans, of marine areas, has an impact on the conservation of animals, but also on the conservation of human health. When we focus on the concept of health, we need to analyze the concept itself. 80 years ago, there was a definition by the World Health Organization. Health is not only the absence of a disease, it's been healthy, but it's not only about having or not having a disease. We always think of an infection disease, a virus, a bacteria, causing this disease. But the truth is that health is a wider idea. It's about physical, mental, and social well-being. If we feel truly healthy. This uh, vision regarding disease, uh, disease caused by a virus or bacteria, is it's not wrong. It is related to macrobiology. It is about trying to find some pathogens causing a disease, a particular disease. And since the 19th century, we have always tried to find a cause of, uh, of a disease, why we are having a disease, for example. However, having or not having a disease depends on many factors not only a virus or a pathogen. We need to focus on uh, natural factors, for example, resistance or susceptibility. If you are if you may have or not have a, a disease, for example, it depends Regarding animals, it depends on the age, if it is an older animal or if it is a, a calf, for example. But we also have to focus on other factors like the species, the race, or the individual itself. All these uh, factors will have an impact on the probability of having or not having a disease. When we talk about, for example, uh, tobacco, and we know it's not good for our health, well, we always 
say, my grandparents used to smoke for a long time and he didn't die due to a disease, a tobacco-related disease. Well, it's true there are some individuals uh, which are more likely to suffer or not suffer a disease, for example. And it also depends on an external factors. These factors could be very particular, and these are called genetic factors, for example. They could have a different impact on an individual, and they could develop different genetic changes on an individual, and they could lead to a tumor, to a cancer, or to another disease, but it is true that in other individuals, these individuals won't suffer any disease at all. And this is important when we are trying to prevent uh, a disease, uh, for example, because we are always trying to find a cause, but sometimes we can't identify the true cause of a, of a disease. And this is a problem when we are trying to find some measures in order to avoid a disease. We also have environmental factors. These factors have an impact on, on health. For example, temperature. This is especially important nowadays with the climate change. The rising in temperature could have an impact on diseases for example an in a rise in, in temperature in an area uh, could cause a duplication a quickly duplication in virus for example these changes in temperature some of them due to uh, human impact, for example, could also be due to natural changes. When we are talking about climate change, we are including the rising in temperature due to the natural cycles and our planet Earth, and uh, we are including too human impact. Other factors are the water quality with more or less nutrients, for example, and finally some meteorological phenomena. And this is particularly important regarding huge and mass stranding. Unfortunately, in the Canary Island, we don't have these events, but for example, in Cape Verde, these uh, phenomena are quite uh, usual. This mass stranding, we don't know exactly the, the cause yet, but some uh, meteorological phenomena are important because there are some pla some places on on the earth where the tide is very low and sometimes these animals are captured in in this in this area and they couldn't go away but apart from these natural factors uh, we, have, uh, we have some anthropogenic factors. Uh, humans, as a, 
a species have an impact on our surroundings. Living on an island or living on a territory, this could have an impact on the environment when we feed, when we use natural resources, etc. When we talk about anthropogenic factors, we know there are some impacts, but we need to know how far we can impact. So this impact is not counterproductive at all. It is interesting to uh, analyze natural preservation and environmental preservation. And this is important because nature is uh, something external to us. Nature existed before uh, human beings. Uh, it will exist when we are not here in the future, but the environment and the ecosystem, and we are part of this environment and the ecosystem, and we need to protect it, and we need to protect this environment. The health of this environment will depend on our behavior as human beings. And we need, we need, as human beings, we need to preserve the environment. So when we try to uh, analyze these factors, we need to know how far we may impact on, on the environment, on our habitat. Particularly when we talk about cetaceans and marine environments, these anthropogenic factors are, are different in, in nature. The most common factors are uh, the overfishing, for example. When we try to eliminate as many fishes as possible, it is a human resource. It is a resource for human beings, but also for other animals. And we need to analyze the impact of this overfishing on other species. But there are other factors. Uh, for example, if we start to uh, remove some nutrients from the sea, the animals will move to other areas to feed. So density will increase, density of animals will increase in some areas and will decrease in other areas. So there will be an increase on infectious disease, uh, for example. So this is an indirect impact due to overfishing. And this is exactly the same when we talk about aquaculture. Sometimes we are observing, we are concentrating nutrients and animals in the same place. So the density is higher in these areas. In marine aquaculture, we have uh, cetaceans getting closer to these areas, but not only cetaceans, but also uh, fishes and some predators. And they will concentrate around these cages. And this uh, will cause a feeder effect. And there will be an increase on diseases. 
As we previously said, related to bycatch or the fishing interaction, this will be another threat we will have. We also talk about marine traffic. It is very important here in the Canary Islands how this marine traffic could have an impact on cetaceans, for example. And if this traffic could have an impact on collisions with big uh, cetaceans, for example. And if this traffic could be the cause for some deaths too. This is very important, but it is a visible problem. We have big animals which collide with ferries, for example, and we know this is an obvious threat. And sometimes these factors this factor hides other factors. When we talk about marine traffic, we need to know that just the presence of boats, vessels, and the noise of these uh, boats and vessels, uh, all these have an impact on the surroundings and on the, on the animal's health. Other factor is uh, pollution. When we talk about pollution, we always think of this image, particularly now that uh, we are talking a lot about plastics. And every time we think about these huge plastics, microplastics, nanoplastics, we always uh, think about this uh, plastic degradation, this uh, degradation in a small particles. These particles normally arrives, uh, arrive to the sea. But uh, it's not only uh, about uh, microplastic, just, uh, for example, synthetic fiber. Uh, and when we do the washing machine at home, the microplastics of our clothes will also arrive uh, to the sea, for example. So when we talk about, about anthropog anthropo anthropogenic factors, we need to cover different ideas. Sometimes we try to control some of these factors, but it is true that some of them are very difficult to identify. Within the pollution, apart from plastics, we have different type of pollution. Here in the Canary Islands, in the Macaronesia, in this uh, area, uh, this is an area of concentration for plastics. And when we see some dead uh, animals, uh, and when we do the necropsy, we find uh, these uh, plastics inside the animal. But we also need to talk about chemical pollution. There is a huge amount of chemical components in our daily lives, pesticides, herbicides, a huge amount of article we use in our daily life, and 
they all increase the amount of uh, pollutions on our seas. And as the animals are growing in the trophic chain, the number of plastics and pollution in the species is also increasing. Other type of pollution is the acoustic pollution. This is one of the issues we previously mentioned. Here it is very complex to analyze this type of factor. It is true that all the noise from vessels and boats, all these uh, have, an, have an impact on cetaceans. Cetaceans use uh, ecolocalization and use the acoustics. When we analyze this factor, we need to uh, we need to analyze that every noise is not disturbing for um, for animals. So we need to 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 know the impact, how far we may go, where where the limit is. If the environment is affected by the acoustic pollution or not. And finally, we have the biological pollution. There are some components that at the beginning they don't have an impact on the on the seas, but if we concentrate all these components together, they have an impact on the on the sea and they increase the density of some fishes, for example, of some animals. So this could lead to new diseases, infectious diseases, oxygen, etc. This is all about balance. And finally, the climate change. And climate uh, change is due to CO2 gases, for example. And for example, we always think about the loss of uh, territory of the polar bear, the melting of the ice, the rising in temperatures, the changes in tides, for example. But we also have to think about other reasons, because this rise in this increase in temperatures, uh, this could also have an impact on the number of uh, toxic, toxic seaweed, for example. And if the concentration of this seaweed is higher, toxics will also be higher. And this will have an impact on human and animal health living in the area. And sometimes we don't think about this because it is not that visible. 
vamos resumiendo un poco, cuando hablamos de salud, no, no estamos hablando... When we talk about health, uh, we are not talking uh, about health and disease. We are talking about a balance. Every, every animal, every human could be balanced. This is not a fixed idea. A factor could have an impact on the balance. And this balance could change. And for example, stress is one of the factors that could have a natural impact on this uh, balance. And stress is a factor that could help to uh, adapt to these uh, different vital situations. So there is a type of stress, the positive stress, that could have a positive impact in order to adapt to these different situations. But sometimes this adaptation breaks. An animal, a population of animal, a human, uh, for example, they are not able to adapt to these new threatening factors. Uh, for example, if uh, there are less uh, amount of, of food, and if we need to burn calories in order to find food, this physiopathological process, which previously helped us, now it's not helping us at all. And this is this half this has an effect on our health. So we have different factors, natural factors and anthropogenic factors, and this uh, will cause some distress. This distress is a sum of factors. But apart from these problems, we also have natural diseases responsible from responsible for stranding on our coast. We think these strandings are due to a natural cause, for example. But there are also some anthropogenic factors impacting on diseases. And in the Canary Islands, for example, uh, when, son when we, the military, the Navy, use sonars, directly these sonars didn't have an impact on the animal or killing them, but these sonars caused an impact on their behavior. For example, the animals went to the surface very quickly and they suffer from breathing diseases like the divers, for example. So this is a good example. And this is a good example to see how the anthropogenic factors could have an impact too in the natural factors. And the, the stress or this negative stress could also have uh, an impact on the, on the diseases. And this could also lead to some alterations in the immune system. For example, there are pollutants which could have an impact on the capacity to, to defense. But this is not so simple. 
A primary disease could cause a decrease in the defenses of an animal, the distress too. All these could cause alterations in the immune systems and the pathogen agents, these secondary pathogen agents, could also have an impact on the, on the animal. And they could cause uh, the death, for example. So there could be death due to natural factors when these natural factors are caused by other anthropogenic factors. And they could cause alterations in the immune system and in the endocrine systems, for example. They act as hormones altering the hormone system of animals. They cause diseases, tumors, And these tumors could be the cause of death of the animal. And the stress could also increase these factors. And there could also be reproductive alterations. And maybe it could have an impact on the amount of calves, for example. And this has an impact on the population. Well, I wanted to use all these lines for you to see how complex this system is. And we are always talking about multifactorial processes affecting health and well-being of animals. And this could have an impact on the pathological processes or in a decrease in the reproductive performance. Sometimes you don't know why the population is decreasing. You see, there is a, a small amount of cars, for example, and this could be due to natural causes. pathological processes that could lead to the death, for example, of the animal, or chronicity. And this chronicity could lead to the death or to the uh, decrease in the reproductive performance. And we have some risk uh, factors, and these risk uh, factors are not necessarily be mm, threats because maybe they don't have a serious impact on populations. So when we identify these risk factors, we need to analyze if they are true threats and if these threats could have an impact on individuals or in populations. When we talk before about collisions, Let's imagine there is a collision with a huge uh, population and some of these animals died. Uh, yes, uh, we have a uh, threat for individuals, but not for the whole populations. But if we see uh, some animals dying and the population is a small population, we need to analyze the, the impact on both cases. So experts need to analyze uh, the cetaceans population in this case uh, together with vets and they all need to analyze the factors together. Establecer 
and if uh, we know all these factors, we could have some preventive uh, measures. And this will be the, the cycle, how this environmental health has an impact on animals and on human health. And this animal health also has a negative impact on humans. Now with this uh, COVID pandemic, it is important to see how an important percentage of infectious disease come from, from animals. And how all this traffic chain is protecting us from infectious diseases. Not only because the uh, biggest predators are going to eliminate the, the threat, but because there will also be a dilution effect. So the risk will be less in our public health. And we are focusing especially on this in the Marset project, we try to identify cetaceans not only as a environmental species to be protected, but also as a health resource, because due to the, the age, due to their position on the traffic chain, they are an umbrella species for the habitat. And they are a good example to identify the health of the habitat and the health of the other animals depending on cetaceans. And they also show us the amount of pollutants and the type of pollutants in the area. And regarding to all the topics of the concept, cetaceans is not only a health resource, but also an economic and tourist resource. If we use cetaceans in a sustainable way, we could take advantage of it. And with this idea, we decided to create three years ago the Marset Network. This is the, the union of the different Macaronesian archipelagos and the surrounding countries, because I don't know why uh, cetaceans don't think, obviously, about borders. They move. So the actions we need to take in order to preserve them are international or local action. But we also uh, need to analyze these uh, problems with uh, from different sides. We all need to agree among entrepreneurs, governments, authorities. We all need first to know what is happening and secondly, to take the necessary measures. So the Marset networks network comprises vets, oceanographers, entrepreneurs, whale watching companies, scientists. We use new technologies and new ticks. We use all the information information available in order to protect this area. In the case, in this case, the Macaronesia area. And finally, 
in this Marset network. One of the projects we have is the Marset 2. If we talk about uh, Azores, Madeira, the Canary Island, and Cape Verde, uh, we uh, particularly uh, focus on the common bottlenose dolphin and the short fin pilot whales. We divide this uh, project in three main purposes. The first one, the scientific purpose. We need to analyze the risk factors, the threats, the second purpose is the informative purpose uh, in order to protect these habitats we need to inform people we need to uh, make them aware of the habitats of the importance of having healthy habitats and healthy cetaceans And we, we have uh, informative campaigns, for example. And finally, uh, we have corporate, a corporate purpose. We focus on the importance of the valuing this eco-tourist activity. We want whale watching to be a sustainable activity, and this activity could also help us to monitor the, the animals and to preserve them. And definitely, this is the Marset 2 project, and this is the project currently in force in the Macaronesia. Thank you all very much for your participation in this Congress. I'm very proud, I'm very excited for all the participants and all the participation we have held. And I will be pleased to answer to all your questions. Thank you very much, Jesus. Now, thank you for your vision, for your project, and for the need to, to have a balance, especially today. Your vision is great, and now let's go to the questions. Uh, you have talked about uh, strokes in the Canary Islands. Yes, there has there had been other places with a stranding, with seafuse stranding, for example. These animals are very special because unlike other animals, they can't go quickly to the surface. They need to go a step by a step. So if these sonars are used, they could cause an impact on the animals and they could quickly go to the surface. In other areas of the planet, thanks to the research we did on, in the Canary Islands, we have discovered these events in other parts of the world, and we have verified all these problems was related to an embolia due to the use of sonars. And one question, one interesting question. How fast ferries could reduce the speed? Well, first, I need ferries are the first interested party in having a lower impact on this problem. But we need to analyze not only the decrease in the speed, 
but also the particular place where the speed should be decreased, where the main problem is located. So it is very important to analyze in depth not only the particular impact or the death of some animals or knowing that there are some collisions, but we also need to increase our knowledge and to, to limit the areas, to reduce the, the space and to protect the, the species and where the speed of the ferries should be uh, decreased, or if, for example, the route could be changed, or if the vessels should be changed. But if we don't know it, if we just have uh, a general knowledge about it, it is very difficult to have an agreement on this sense. Well, uh, Thank you very much, Jesus. Thank you very much, Eric. We are going to close our session. It is very, very interesting. Sorry for the delay. Just saying we continue with the Congress. Tomorrow we have another networking session. You can register and you can talk about different people regarding whale watching. We also have a survey. So please answer the survey. You will have all the information on, all the information available on the platform. All the materials on the information will be available and also a video. You will see this video tomorrow and you will watch citations in Tenerife. Some experts will explain you this biodiversity. So I hope to see you tomorrow there. We close this session. This is a hope spot, as Silvia L. said. The Canary Island was a perfect candidate. Eric Hoyt has told us so today. Maybe this pandemic is a good example. Teresa Rivera also told us uh, the same at the beginning of the Congress. The new type of tourism could be a sustainable tourism. And I would like to close this session by looking at the Macaronesia Islands. Here uh, we have an amazing colony of cetaceans. We need to preserve them and we need to have marine protected areas. Uh, they will be 30% in 2030, sorry. And we, we are going to finish with the words of Aida Cedres, which is the director of the science, of the product, tourist products of Tenerife. Yes. Now, I give bueno, the pues, me ha tocado a mí well, cerrar el close the Congress. I would like to continue throughout the year because this Congress has been a very fruitful experience. I would like to thank all the speakers and all professionals behind the Congress and behind this platform which are helped to develop this first International Congress of Whale Watching. The speakers are very thankful too. Thank you for your work. For Tenerife, it is clear that the celebration of this Congress has been a step further, an important step further. 
we need to work on sustainable products. Uh, we are going to promote ecotourism and we will make population aware of all our value chain. We need to reinforce sustainability. We need to respect the environment. We need to protect the, the environment and the species. But we also need to promote the development of new companies, new jobs and new specialized services related to ecotourism. We need, we still have a long way to go uh, regarding this activity and other tourist activity. But if we focus on whale watching, this is a very important activity and this is a road we will draw up together. We are going to create networking events and we are going to create events with authorities. We has a moratorium. Uh, we are going to analyze the carrying capacity. And we still has, have a long way to go. We will continue working with the companies from the Sustainable Charter for Whale Watching. And we will try to specialize in ecotourism. We will try to make population aware of the Tenorasca conservation area. We will promote communication, conservation, and we will try this communication is divided in different stages and we will involve uh, people interested in this type of ecotourism. A, visitors, a visitor who wants to know to better know the environment and we will promote the Mars 2 project. I hope, I truly hope we will organize a second international congress of whale watching or other events like that. I think this has been a very fruitful congress and we are investing on that. Tenerife is a well-known tourist destination and it is a particularly important place for whale watching. And we need to preserve this value. We need to preserve and develop this activity, but always protect it, the marine areas. Uh, finally, I want to thank all the attendants and I want to thank the the networking sessions too. This Congress has promoted the importance of cetaceans in Tenerife as a tourist destination and this tourist destination wants to invest on sustainability. We have shared ideas, good practices and we hope to create new projects and finally just to close thank you all for meeting you and i'm going to read the words of sylvia l we must be proactive in order to protect marine leaves and we also need to take measures to protect leaves on earth thank you very much good health and bye